book two. I have some mail for you this morning, and it's uh, very similar in its outline to what mail has been recently. It's a couple of packages and a couple of periodicals. Uh, I thought we'd go through them together. It doesn't have to be a very long video, although the periodicals were very thought-provoking. There's two winners again this time around. There's the New York Review of Books, which is one of the greatest English-language book reviews of them all, uh, and Vanity Fair, a square-bound glossy magazine that I really like. I have liked it pretty much for the whole of its current incarnation. Uh, and each one of them had fascinating things uh, in them this time around. And I thought we'd go through a couple of those fascinating things together. This is the New York Review of Books. It's called The Art Issue, uh, because they have a couple of uh, vaguely art-connected pieces. Trust me, uh, it's a temptation when an editor sees that sort of thing and says, well, let's just, it looks like we've got you know, three pieces in the pipeline that are vaguely connected to some subject or other. Let's make an issue. Uh, it's very seldom pre-planned. It's usually just happenstance. Uh, and it's not the whole issue, obviously. it's not The whole thing is not devoted to that. In fact, one of the pieces in here is by Tim Flannery, who's terrific. I don't know how many of you have read his work, but he is he is really, really good as a popular science writer. And in, in this essay, did why did they did they vanish? That's that's the they in question there is a Crow Magnum there, a Neanderthal. Uh, and this is called Kindred, Neanderthal Life. Love, Death, and Art by Rebecca Rag Sykes from Bloomsbury, a book that I don't believe I ever got, in which the part of the joy of the New York Review of Books is that their stable of regular writers are so good. They're not just jobbing book reviewers. They're experts in writing about their own subject matter. So one of the joys of the New York Review of Books is that you get to read them on the subject, and they know that. So the, most of the time, the pieces in the New York Review of Books are not just scrupulous point-by-point -point book reviews. They're usually book discussions, subject discussions. Tim Flannery does review this book. He doesn't particularly like it. Uh, but the joy of this piece is, is just reading him writing about Neanderthals. <laughs> uh, and it naturally, I was waiting for him to get to a bone of contention between the two of us, and he, he did not disappoint. He gets to that. I want to read you the pertinent uh, section here. The Survival of Hybrids. He's talking about hybrids between Homo sapiens sapiens and Neanderthals, who, now that we have genetic analysis, we know for a fact that they did interbreed. And as one expert put it, in, uh, quoted in this article, if they interbreed and they, if they interbred and they had children, then those children had to be cared for. They had to be loved. Neanderthal children were as helpless as Homo sapiens children when they were born. Uh, so it can't have been just anathema. It can't have been something that, that both species hated or those children would not have lived. Uh, but anyway, uh, so, so the survival of hybrids suggests that Neanderthal and Homo sapiens should be viewed as allo species, that is, broadly similar species whose ranges abut rather than broadly overlap. But around 40,000 years ago, something disrupted this. A jawbone found in Romania provides an insight into what might have occurred. The jaw, which is 37,000 to 42,000 years old, is from a hybrid. One uh, of those, one of whose great grandparents, or perhaps great 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 grandparents, was a Neanderthal, while its other ancestor was Homo sapiens, whose genetic makeup falls within the diversity of living Africans, so a modern human. Um, an analysis of 50 skeletons from Europe dating between 37,000 and 14,000 years ago shows that they all were hybrids. It's as if suddenly the hybrids took over Europe. Your alarm bells might already go be going off there, right? Because we're talking about 40 remains. It's a mighty big extrapolation to make from 40 remains. But he goes on, and it gets worse. Uh, perhaps the most intractable misconception about the Neanderthals is that they were displaced by sapiens. Instead, it is now clear that they were replaced by a mostly well, a most remarkable population of stable hybrids. First of all, your own dating methods have a range of just inside of 10,000 years. And second, you're talking about a handful of hybrids known from genetic composition. That does not in any way rule out that these species were not allo species, that the territory of Homo sapiens and Cro-Magnon, for most of the time when they were uh, when they were extant together, overlapped. Not abutted, but overlapped. And Neither of the points made here, whether it's a jawbone in Romania or a number of hybrids found elsewhere in Europe, rules out the possibility that Neanderthals were shuffled off this mortal coil by Homo sapiens. They certainly were. 
especially when you take into account that it, that Europe is not the only place where the two species met, and the result is always the same. And if you're wondering what the result is, well, look around you for Neanderthals. <laughs> you won't find any Neanderthals. You won't find any of the other human species that were extant and around and abutting or overlapping with the with the territory of Homo sapiens sapiens. You won't find any of them because they were all wiped out by one killer species of hominid. By one species of hominid that cannot stand anything short of genocide. Really, really, genocide really hits their sweet spot. So that even a little kid, even a little human kid, a small child who doesn't even know the word genocide, has never been to school yet, playing around on the sidewalk, who discovers that if they use a magnifying glass, I don't know if kids do this anymore, probably there's a lawsuit, so they, they don't. But may, a little kid discovers that if they refract a ma well, sunlight through a, magnif a magnifying glass just right, they can burn an ant to death on the ground. There has never been a human child in the history of the species that saw that was possible and thought, well, now I know that's possible. That was fun in a sick kind of way. No, instead they have the exact reaction, which is I want to burn to death all the ants. Not just all the ants in this little anthill. All the ants in the world. I'm going to be mad at my parents if they don't let me do that. I want to burn to death all the animals in the world. I'm a little older, and I've discovered that with a heavy enough rock, I can blast a toad into a, like, a, like a water balloon. I don't just want to do that to one toad. I want to do it to all the toads. Not just in my yard, and my neck of the woods, but everywhere. Anyway, <laughs> so like I said, it's a hobby horse between Tim Flannery and myself. But then there's also Vanity Fair, which went whole hog for the cover here uh, for the House of Windsor. That is Diana Spencer and her two boys. And there's an article in here about the split between Prince Philip and Prince Harry uh, that talks about how it's a dagger aimed at the heart of the monarchy and how, you know, they have different temperaments and whatnot and different views of what the monarchy should be and different reactions to the long-term trauma of losing their mother. And barely a glance in the direction of the reason, the one and only obvious reason why there's a split between the two brothers. And it's Meghan Markle. It's a, a viciously manipulative girlfriend who told her boyfriend, you can get everything that I'm offering you, but the price I demand is that you se sever yourself from everyone you know. None of your old friends can come to visit. I don't like any of them. I'm definitely severing from you from your family, including your best friend, your older brother. You can't have anybody but me. Can't be any friends in your life but me. Uh, the article doesn't really glance in her direction when it comes to that, but future histories will, so I'm okay with that. No, the main interesting article in here is about, uh, <laughs> is about Army Hammer. Some of you may recognize this face. Yes? That is Army Hammer. And if you are Army Hammer, you really don't want to feature as the face of an article that says, The Fall of the House of Hammer. <laughs> you really don't want to do that. It's a very good article. It's all about the previous two generations of men in the Hammer family and how utterly poisonous they were to everyone around them, how horrible they acted. But those two earlier progenitors are going to fall into the shadow when it comes to Army Hammer because of recent news. <laughs> some of you, those of you who are not on Twitter all day long uh, might not know some of the rumors that are swirling around Army Hammer, might not know some of the reasons why he has dropped out of all of the major projects that he had lined up. Uh, it's because of very 21st century rumors that started spreading around about him. Tweets and private messages that started to be shared on Twitter of fantasies that he was sharing with his female partners that looked very much to be cannibalistic. Not just a bondage fetish, which he, he does definitely have and openly admits to, but also, I'm not talking spiritual cannibalism here i'm talking actual cannibalism but i i'm so fascinated by you these texts went that i would really like to pull out one of your ribs and eat it <laughs> just, that is not shakespearean metaphor that is deeply unhealthy and like everybody else in the world you know i don't take twitter all that seriously there are plenty of people who do but like everybody else in the world i looked at those things i uh spared a thought for some of the women who or involved in what sounds like what what a couple of them actually called a very creepy guy, and then mainly had a moment of Schadenfreude. There was an article. I think this article tells me <clears throat> uh, where the article is. There was a very famous article. Uh, where was it? Yes, BuzzFeed uh, did an article 
Uh, Okay, I'm not I'm not seeing right off the top of my head the name of the uh, of the writer of the article, but BuzzFeed did an article uh, called 10 Long Years of Trying to Make Army Hammer Happen," in which the writer of the article says, "Look, this has been a huge concerted effort on the part of him, his management, and Hollywood to make him a huge star because he's handsome, and it's not working. So can we maybe stop? There are lots of worthwhile people that we're not pouring this effort into. Maybe we could do that instead of trying to make this actor happen as a star. Uh, so he, would, he was on my radar because of that anyway, because that article alludes to a lot of creepy and seedy and sordid behavior. And I'd heard rumors about his private Instagram and whatnot, in which he talks liberally about uh, massive drug use and... Uh, a fondage for a bondage. <laughs> a fondage for bondage. Uh, I already knew a little bit about the drug use because he is one of the biggest tobacco addicts in Hollywood history. And that's saying a lot since, you know, Humphrey Bogart used to sleep while smoking. <laughs> but, but nevertheless, he's an enormous tobacco addict. And I, so I knew that drug addiction, but there's lots of others too. He's constantly talking in a rather casual way about not only getting blitzed on alcohol, but also on lots of other drugs as well. Uh, but I saw those tweets on you know, on Twitter, I saw those alleged screen caps and thought, eh, okay, so this, this guy is as bad as people, as rumors have been saying that he is, and this probably means a cessation in his career for a year or two until he gets another big role and Hollywood will forget. And I mean, I mean a, a lot of this stuff looks consensual. You know, it's not like the ostracization that was dealt out to Mel Gibson for his offenses, especially, because those were virulent anti-Semitism. It wasn't, it wasn't something that you would readily forgive someone, especially if they weren't penitent. This is the sort of thing, I read it, those things on Twitter and I forgot about them because I thought this is the sort of thing that will blow over. Army Hammer is tall and well-spoken and gorgeous. He will certainly have a Hollywood career. This won't ruin him. And I guess maybe in the back of my mind, I was aware of the fact that the LA Police Department has opened an investigation on him because of some of those alleged previous relationships with women. Uh, but it wasn't until I read this article that I realized, that I learned for the first time, that most of those Twitter screenshots were not, are not attributed to him. And he denies they're him. And when I read them, when I reread them, naturally they're all in this article. I don't think that was very fair on the part of the writer. Who wrote this article? I hope it's not someone I know. <laughs> Julie Miller. Okay, I don't know Julie Miller, and I don't think it was quite fair of her to include those after she's made it clear that they're not written by him. Uh, that, at least that it hasn't been proven. That seems to me to be a little bit dirty pool. I don't think she'd like that if that were done to her. Uh, but I learned in this article that those things are not connected to him except by internet gossip. And so they shouldn't be used to hang him in the court of public opinion or any other court. Uh, but then there was a, there was a piece, uh, there was a bit here that I wanted to, uh, to read to you. Uh, let me see if I can, if I can find it here. Uh, yeah, they're talking about, <laughs> this guy doesn't do himself any favors. He left his family. They were uh, quarantined on the Cayman Islands, and he left them because he was bored with quarantine <laughs> in the middle of a pandemic. He left his family behind. Uh, so th that doesn't do well for him anyway. And the minute he got onto the mainland, he started texting raunchy pictures of himself with another woman, with, with his wife and his children back <laughs> on the Cayman Islands. And he also sent, uh, according to this article, he sent a raunchy text to his latest mistress, only he accidentally sent it to his wife and she started divorce proceedings immediately afterwards. Uh, but we have, we takes off from there. Uh, several weeks later, after he left the, his family to, to stew in their quarantine sinkhole in the Cayman Islands, uh, Hammer found himself in a darker crisis. Amid the turmoil of divorce proceedings, several women took to social media to accuse the actor of emotional abuse, manipulation, and violence. The scandal ballooned as screen grabs circulated that seemed to show the actor describing sexual fantasies involving rape and cannibalism, keyword there being seen, which I missed completely the first time I was taken in. Uh, Hammer stepped away from the two high-profile high projects, a rom-com with Jennifer Lopez and a Paramount series about the making of The Godfather, shortly after his agency dropped him. Then, in mid-March, a woman came forward with detailed allegations of rape and an attack so violent that she thought he was going to kill me. Her words. In a press conference with her lawyer, Gloria Alred, uh, the lawyer is Gloria Alred, the woman is just going by the name Effie. Uh, 
recounted a 2017 assault that lasted for several hours in which Hammer slammed her head against a wall, bruised her face, and whipped her feet with a crop. Hammer's lawyers uh, has uh, maintained that all interactions between Mr. Hammer and his former partners were consensual, uh, releasing correspondence between Effie and Hammer over the course of a four-year relationship, presumably to prove that they, that they had discussed ahead of time everything that she filed a police complaint about. Uh, but as Alred emphasized to Vanity Fair in an earlier interview for this story, while adults may consent to some BDSM practices, they still have a right to withhold consent to other practices. Okay, and the main point I want to make about that, that is absolutely true, you can consent to some freaky, kinky practices and withhold consent from others. That's absolutely true. But what you can't do is withdraw your consent three years later. Okay? And if that is happening to Army Hammer, then he is absolutely right to call it BS. And that is what he's calling it. If, if three years later you decide, you know, now that I look back three years on that thing that I enthusiastically consented to at the time, I'm not sure that I like that I did that. Well, that's called a regret. That shouldn't be called a lawsuit. So now I'm curious to see... Uh, like, for instance, what, what did that... It, it's just the whole thing's been bugging me. Uh, yeah, in mid-March of this year, of 2020, in mid-March of 2020, this Effie person came forward to recount a 2017 assault that involved bruising and cropping on the soles of her feet. Physical marks, in other words. So why did she come forward in 2020 instead of going to the police in 2017? With documentary evidence, which presumably she's shown to her lawyer. Why didn't she do that? Is it possible that she didn't go to the police in 2017 because they would have found her correspondence with her co with her partner in all of those events and would have proven to their own satisfaction in about five minutes that she was a willing participant? And if that's true, then is it possible that she's coming forward with a lawsuit now in 2020 to dogpile this guy and get money out of his very wealthy family? I don't know. When I saw those initial tweets that were purportedly him, and now we learn, I learn, uh, were not, at least not proven to be. When I saw those initially, I thought, okay, you're just a, a Hollywood creep who's drunk on his own good looks and his own power, the power of stardom. So you're treating women as garbage, and that's an old story. I, in other words, when I saw those tweets, I thought, okay, this is darker and kinkier than I expected, but I definitely believe it. I certainly believe it. And now I don't. Now I don't believe it anymore. Now I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that I believe he's innocent. His own comments have made it clear that he's anything but innocent, at least in the theological sense. But it sounds to me, the thread running through this sounds to me like, and the people who've come forward to defend him corroborate this, it sounds to me like he's always been fairly careful to, get, to make sure that the partner in all these things was consensual, specifically because of the off-color nature of the things he was suggesting. Uh, the writer, Julie Miller, the writer of the piece, uh, makes mention of the fact that although half a dozen people came forward to defend Army, Sa Army Hammer in her research for the piece, none of them was willing to go on record. They're not willing to be identified. And she, she cast that at the point when she brings it up as a little bit of a damning detail. That, you know, if, if you're sure that he's innocent, why wouldn't you defend him in public? Why wouldn't you go on record? I don't know. I don't know why she would make that implication in light of the piece that she herself is writing which shows the high cost that can be paid by someone uh, if they do put their name out there in public, even if the person they're defending is innocent. Just think, those of you who know this Army Hammer story, who know all this, this salacious story that broke, what was it, a couple of months ago? Uh, those of you who know that story, just imagine how you would reflexively think of someone who gave their name to a defense of this guy. You would immediately think, uh, at worst, at, at best, uh, they're hoodwinked by someone who's obviously guilty, and at worst, they might be guilty themselves. And everybody knows that. Everybody who's defending him to Judy Miller or anybody else knows that. So of course they wouldn't be anonymous. Of course they wouldn't go on record. I don't know. To me, what was a brief Twitter spat, just a, a bit of Twitter schadenfreude and then you move on, has now become something genuinely interesting. And I'm really hoping Julie Miller, I might not agree with some of the, the gimmicks that she plays in this Vanity Fair piece, but who knows how much of that was the idea of her editors. Vanity Fair, as far as I know, has a fairly hands-on editorial process. One way or another, she's a terrifically engaging writer, so I'm really hoping that this is a book. I'm really hoping that she's working on a book. That would be terrific. Because now the subject interests me. 
And if she does a ton of original research on Army Hammer's father and grandfather, I'd love to read that too. So one way or another, that's those are the periodicals. Then we have two packages for this mail haul. Uh, what have we got here? They're both fairly heavy, so they both could be May finished copies, which would be kind of ironic because I don't need them anymore. <laughs> it's just the way of it. I need June finished copies now. Okay? <laughs> I need finished copies for the month of June. So watch these. These will probably both be finished copies for the month of May. <laughs> I will still, I mean, that's, I love uh, finished copies and I will still review them. Uh, but I was hungry for finished copies for the month of May well well early in April because in addition to being a prolific reviewer I am also now a book section editor for a tiny full color newspaper in northern Georgia and it is very tiny so we can't pay our freelancers and if that's the case you really want to get a finished copy to your freelancers so they get a byline and a finished copy that's not money but it's not nothing in fact, it's so far away from being nothing that the uh, the standard model for freelance re book reviewing for a long time was that. It was you you get a copy of the book, you get to keep it instead of going to the bookstore and shelling out $15 for it, and you get a byline. And if I take you a, another piece of yours, you get another byline. And then another byline. And maybe by the, core, by the end of a year, if your pieces have never displeased me, if I've got, you know, letters about them, positive or negative, if I got response, if you're striking a, no a tone with the readers, well, then maybe I do start to pay you at that point. So you, you get the books, but maybe you do get a little money then, or maybe a little more than a little money. That's the way it used to work. For a long, long time, a freelance book reviewer just starting out could not expect to be paid for a review. You got the book. So, but anyway, <laughs> let's see what we have here. Oh, great. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Uh, this is a finished copy for, of something that we did not get a, an advanced copy for, if I remember correctly. Uh, but all... Is this May? Yes, it's May. It's, it's a finished copy of May. Okay, well, that's all right. I just still want it. I look at all these blurbs. Good Lord. Okay, fantastic. Uh, this is from the great folks at W.W. Norton. And this is a great historian. Some of you may know this name. This is Alan Taylor. Uh, and, uh, oh, he won the Pulitzer Prize. Didn't know that. His histories are great. They're fantastic. And this is his new book, American Republics. A Continental History of the United States from 1783 to 1850. Alan Taylor did... Uh, uh, he twice won the Pulitzer Prize in history, most recently for Internal Enemy, which also won, was a finalist for the National Book Award. But I want to name this book that you will know him for. Uh, American Colonies. American Colonies, which is now a, a, a Penguin trade paperback, if I, if I remember correctly. He's terrific. He's just really good at this. Uh, let's see here. And this is a revelatory look at our nation's formative years. Sweeping in scope and scale, and yet vivid in particulars, Taylor's latest upends the traditional narrative of a young nation confident in its continent-spanning destiny. Instead, this book offers a powerful portrait of a fragile and embattled, embattled nation, its internal divisions only exacerbated by expansion across a contested continent, and hence the title. Right? Some of you will remember the, the great moment in Ken Burns' Civil War documentary where Shelby Foote says that the Civil War was the moment in American history when people stopped talking about the United States are and started saying the United States is. And that before that, it was possible for someone like the arch-traitor Robert E. Lee to say that he was going to war in defense of his country and mean Virginia. That it was American republics, plural. It was very much a conglomeration of individual nation states until the refiner's fire of the American Civil War. And that's what this is going to deal with. So you'll have, uh, what have we got here? 1783 to 1850. So the, one of the key moments in there will be the War of 1812. Uh, fantastic. Very happy to have a finished copy of this. That's, that's great. All right. So uh, that was one. Uh, and now... Let's do this other one. It also is very heavy, so it also could be a finished copy, probably for May. Uh, let's see. Okay, you've got to be kidding me. Yes, this is another May finished copy. When I, right when I don't need them. Yeah, this is another May finished copy. All right. Well, okay, that's fine. Uh, I still want it very much, though. So. This is uh, Catherine Parr, The Sixth Wife, by Alison Weir. This concludes her series of big, fat historical novels about the wives of Henry VIII. 
And I, I have really enjoyed this series, largely enjoyed this series, but even so, I am calling for a stern moratorium on anyone ever doing this again. Novelist or biographer, let's stop doing this. Let's stop rewarding Henry's necrotic womanizing by making it the theme of a literary project. Let's not, let's stop having series of historical novels about this one guy's wives. <laughs> okay, let's do, let's stop that. Uh, but what have we got here? This comes out in the middle of May, same as American Republics. Uh, and it's the exciting finale uh, to the Tudor Queen series. So this is Henry VIII's last wife, Catherine Parr, a woman that, that came to him long after even Henry thought he could conceive an heir. There was no real fault or all about that. She was mainly taken on. She didn't look anything like that, of course. <laughs> she was mainly taken on as a mother for his children. And she succeeded in that role beautifully in a way that none of Henry's other wives could have done. None of them would have been as effective as she was. Uh, and she outlived him and was his regent when he was out, when he was out of England. Uh, let's see here. This is an extraordinary novel. tells the story of Henry, the, Henry VIII's sixth and final wife, who manages to survive him and remarry, only to be thrown into a romantic intrigue that threatens the very throne of England. Uh, having sent his much-beloved but deceitful young wife, Catherine Howard, to, the, to her beheading, uh, King Henry fixes his lonely eyes on a more mature woman, 36-year-old, twice-widowed Catherine Parr. She, however, is in love with Sir Thomas Seymour, brother to the late Queen Jane. Aware of his rival, Henry sends him abroad, leaving Catherine no choice but to become Henry's sixth queen in 1543. The king is no longer in any condition to father a child, but Catherine is content to mother his three children, Mary, Elizabeth, and the longed-for male heir, Edward. Four years into the marriage, Henry dies, leaving England's throne to nine-year-old Edward, a puppet in the hands of the ruthlessly ambitious royal courtiers, and Catherine's life takes a more complicated turn. Thrilled at this renewed opportunity to wed her first love, Catherine doesn't realize that Sir Thomas now sees her as a mere stepping stone to the throne. Uh, his eye actually set on bedding and wedding 14-year-old Princess Elizabeth. The princess is innocently flattered by his attentions, allowing him into her bedroom to the shock of her household. The result is a tangled tale of love and a struggle for power, bringing close to a close a dramatic and violent reign of Henry VIII. <coughs> and of course, for a good part of this, we get the reign of King Edward. Uh, and I, I have read all of these books. I've reviewed a couple of them. I believe, yeah, this the sheet, the pub sheet has a. Sorry. There's an emergency somewhere. Didn't know you couldn't use this right cooker in bed. Didn't know that. So the whole of the whole parade. I'm not going to redo the video just because we have 80 sirens in the background. But the the back of the pub sheet has blurbs for every one of the previous books, and the top one for the Catherine of Aragon book is me. I went to bat for that first book years and years ago with a different editor at the Christian Science Monitor. Uh, and had a blast. It's, I mean, I, I'm calling a moratorium for this dumb, lazy organizing principle, but I'm not denying the, the interest of most of the wives. Catherine Howard was not interesting, but everyone else is, and I think Catherine Parr is the most interesting of them all. She is my favorite of the wives of Henry VIII, the first woman uh, ever to publish a book under her own name in the English language, uh, and a fascinating figure, just fascinating. Not so much for her, her post- you know, for her 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 romantic adventures after Henry's death, I think, as for her role in Henry's reign, where she was not only regent when he was away, but also was embroiled in a religious uh, controversy that may well have cost her her life, if not for her own steadfast courage in the face of Henry's anger, which not every person could muster. Not even a lot of the seasoned warrior men at Henry's court could have stood up to him the way she did. And it's really through her own wits, through her own ability to read him and to just face him with complete honesty, that she was to survive. Otherwise, we might be talking about another beheaded wife. It might easily have come to that. Uh, actually served with the warrant for her own arrest, which would certainly have been her own death. Uh, so I'm not saying that it's not a fascinating subject. It absolutely is. This will probably be the only one of these books that I keep. Uh, I have all the other Catherine and Parr novels, and I think they're fascinating. Uh, but it'd be nice if we could move on to other things. Henry was a king, after all. In addition to being 
a serial marrier. He was also a king. Uh, but anyway, those are our books for today. One fiction and nonfiction. Both finished copies for May when I don't need them anymore, but I'm very happy to have them both. And by Proven Feast. They're both, these are both proven writers on for me. Alan Taylor is great as a historian. Alison Weir is no mean shakes as a historian either, and I tend to like her historical fiction. So I'm, I'm actually happy to have both of these. Although I don't think I'm commissioned to review either one of them. Pretty sure I'll just be reviewing them on my own hook. Uh, but anyway, there you go. That is the mail for today. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up. Uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, book two.